It's radioactive environment in the eternal dark of the underground at unattainable altitudes. Kazakhstan's vast lands attract researchers and explorers and our filming crew are no exception. By going down only a few meters underground, one can discover a whole new world, the world full of riddles and mysteries. In the course of our previous episodes, we visited excavation sites and labs, as well as learned many interesting facts about the Oja princess found three years ago and the times in which she lived. We managed to x-ray her and get good digital imagery and drawings. We did some tests too. Based on that, we got some valuable data. It was really exciting and unexpected, if I may. After scanning the soil block on the tomographer, we actually saw what was inside of it on the monitor, although it was still buried inside. It was unbelievable. Most likely she was a bride. This is what I think. For sure it was a woman. She was wearing a headdress resembling the ones we can see on women today. I mean the Sao Kele. They were very skilled and talented jewelry makers. Even today, with all available technology, it would be hard to repeat what they did. What we do is we leave it all as is, just prepare it for preservation. We will put a glass dome over it, so it will be possible to exhibit it in the museum. The quest for knowledge has brought us to Taraz, one of the oldest cities of Kazakhstan. It is close to it where the mysterious and otherworldly fortress of Akhetas is located. So currently accompanied by local off-roaders and Tayyar Mokhtarov, a local historian, our team is heading to a location in between the border of Kyrgyzstan and the Talas River to reveal the secrets of this long-forgotten settlement. People were always attracted to this area. It was one of the waypoints of the Great Silk Way and served as an ancient traffic intersection. This is the only place through which you can reach the Kyrgyz range or say the Talas Ridge. After passing this gorge, we will come to the place where the old caravan track passed. Depending on their destination after this place, the caravans would follow different valleys and gorges. As believed, Akitas has unearthly and mystic properties. They say it can cure people and charge pilgrims with energy and power. Some claim it is not by accident that extended its main structural vectors cross Mecca and Kailas. Others say that the scope of works at Akitas's construction was similar to that of a medium-sized Egyptian pyramid. Whether due to mystic forces or not, but as soon as we approached the ancient settlement, the weather got really bad. We even tried to begin filming, but in vain. It started raining heavily. Thus, we had to back off. But our unsuccessful trip turned out a good acquaintance. By accident, we learned that one of our rough roaders was also breeding birds of prey. So we decided to go to see the farm without surrendering the idea of conquering Akutas later. Unfortunately, at present, it is practically impossible to see Seika falcons, these handsome birds, in natural conditions, not to mention in the process of hunting. As far as I know, their population is decreasing around the world and they are considered an endangered species. In other words, we got really lucky today. Hello, how do you do? I hope you could show us your amazing birds today. Yes, of course, come on in. My ultimate goal is to increase the population of Seika falcons in Kazakhstan. Actually, not only in Kazakhstan, because they will migrate to the south and come back to the north of Kazakhstan in the spring. According to experts, the birds that live here in the nursery will never be able to live in the wild. They will simply not survive as they have been here since their birth. Their offspring, on the contrary, will have an important mission – try to increase the wild population of these birds in all of our country. They need to learn to fly, to take wings. It is impossible to do this in a cage, even if it is an open-air cage. So the plan is to make special nests for them somewhere really high, where the neither land nor flying predators can get them and far away from people, of course. With time, we plan to move the nursery out of town. 
The roof of the cage consists of two sections. It is basically divided into two parts. Solid, a closed roof for protection from snow and rain, and an open one, so that they could see the sky, the weather, day and night. They need to feel the nature. It is important for a bird to remain wild. How often do you feed them? Once a day, which makes it six times a week. It should be seven. Oh, they have a day off on Wednesday. They take a break from food. The birds' lunch today is birds. Chicken meat is one of their favorite delicacies. The experts say that in the wild, their food ration is generally quite diverse. Occasionally, I feed them with horse meat, beef or even quail. And pigeons, of course. They all have different characters. Some are quiet and some are cranky. Some of them are afraid of humans. This one, for example, is very calm and gives in to training better than its relatives. We decided to take part in a training. Frankly speaking, I wasn't really cool about it as the falcon would be hunting a live pigeon. But the nursery staff tried to calm me down by saying that, first of all, due to Falcon's lack of experience, the pigeon might very well survive, and second of all, that this is the law of nature. It is hard to dodge that. A healthy bird, meaning a bird that is ready for hunting, has a certain shape and size of wings, size of legs, and even beak. Looking at nostrils can give you a lot of information too. Big nostrils mean a high-speed bird. So this is the place. The pigeon's leg is tied with a thread to a pole preventing it to move outside the one and a half meter radius. They remove the cap of the falcon's head. And at first it seems like it has no idea what to do. A couple of seconds later, the pigeon tweaks and the Seika falcon's natural instincts take effect. However, the pigeon has survived. Perhaps the predator wasn't that hungry this time. Having caught good weather, we are back on the road heading to our main destination. The hope is that Ake Tas duly appreciates our persistence and lets us in. I myself am somewhat skeptical when it comes to paranormal stuff, but thorough investigation does require looking at something from different angles. So should it be an integral element of Ake Tas, it is of interest to us. The ancient settlement is indeed one of the most mysterious and unique historical monuments under examination for more than 150 years. The settlement campus includes a fortified perimeter, several estates, a caravan sarai or a choultry, as well as several watchtowers and fortresses. The hydrotechnical and engineering installations like water storage basins, dams and channels are more than impressive. The layout includes fields and gardens, quarries and clay pits, gange production shops and what not. However, the settlement of unbelievable scope and beauty was not completed. Having written hundreds of pages of scientific research papers, the leading orientalists, local historians and archaeologists still fail to give a reasonable answer why. There are different theories that it was a house of worship of some kind, a Buddhist, a Nestorian Christian or a Zoroastrian temple. But would you agree with me that a religious facility does not require five meter wide fortification walls? By the way, the overall dimensions of Akutas are simply bedazzling. Just imagine a rectangular fortification 205 by 180 meters with ideally straight walls five or even more meters high. I must say that earlier Akitas' walls were two meters higher. They took two meters of stones for construction. For example, the bridges of the Turkistano Siberian Railway, which runs nearby, and a warehouse at one of the neighboring railway stations of Akchulak. It all happened around 1928-1930. As it turned out later, the stone used for building Akutas was not a typical construction material for Taraz residents of that time whatsoever. People who live here will tell you that in the old days, in Taraz, they used to build with adobe, cob, brick or small rocks. So it is not typical. No, not at all, that's for sure. 
Somebody else who came here from other places built the whole thing, not the locals. Locals would never use this kind of stone for construction, locate the facility this way. Look up there, do you see the quarry up there? Tell me how they transported such large blocks from there down here. Some of them weigh several tons, so how did they bring them here? A good question. It's all just one big riddle, that's what it is. Indeed, there are so many theories and speculations regarding the origin and purpose of Akhetas that we decided to sift it to the bottom and are heading to the city to do this. Looking back at the fortress through the window, we are driving towards Taraz, as the staff of the Monuments of Ancient Taraz National Open Air Museum promised to help us out with this mysterious matter, how Akhetas appeared and what purpose it served. In any case, this is going to be a great opportunity to learn more about the secrets concealed by the walls of this majestic complex. On the way to the city, we finally saw what Taye Mokhtarov was talking about earlier. This is the bridge on the way to Akhetas. It can be called the border between the past and the present. One part of the bridge is new, whereas the other one, as we were told, is built with stones taken from Akhetas. We are in Taraz, a truly unique place. Here, everything around you breathes with history. It is not a rare case when local residents find ancient artifacts in their backyards. Not to mention the fact that many buildings, which are still in use in the city, are ancient monuments. I'm about to meet somebody who will slice and dice it for you and me. We are coming for you, Akitas. There is nothing exactly like it anywhere in the world. There are similar structures in Syria, Jordan and Saudi Arabia, which tells us that this type of architecture belongs more to the Arab world. So the question that the scientists are working on is how it came here, to Central Asia. From sources we know that one of Arab commanders, Abu Muslim Kutayba, did come to Central Asia, but during a different period of time. There are a lot of other blank pages in the history of the place, like with the grandiose scale of the settlement complex, we still don't know for sure who built it. And what's up with that? No paranormal, no extraterrestrials or Egyptian pyramids. Then why is the complex located so far from the city and water sources? Without a doubt, Akutas was constructed for military purposes. It is located on a platform from where one can easily observe all the area around. In other words, it was a fortified palace type of installation. Something went wrong and the construction was abandoned. We only have rough estimations as to the time of construction, approximately the 8th century. That was the time of large-scale international processes in this area. In 751, on the bank of the Talas River, a landmark event took place, the Atlak battle between the Chinese and the Arab armies. The Arabs won. A local Turkic tribe called the Karluks significantly contributed to their victory. Most likely, they started building the settlement right after the Atlak battle. It might be that the Karluks and the Arabs entered into covenant and became allies at least for some time. It should be noted that all these are merely allegations, as we have no written historical evidence to back them, unfortunately. In the 13th century, a Taoist monk called Chan Chun traveled through this area. In his diary he wrote that he saw a military garrison on the road and that it was already abandoned. In other words, by the 13th century nobody lived in the fortress. Unique, mysterious and with a lot of history to it. This is the way Akitas appeared to us. Should you ever go there, you will find something special for yourself and feel that it is indeed a fascinating place. As to ourselves, we fell under the spell of Taraz and decided to stay there a little longer. It seemed that we were caught inside a time machine as we never saw so many ancient artifacts in one place. In the next issue. During an invasion, if the city was attacked or put under siege by the enemies, the governor of the city and his bodyguards could leave it unnoticed. Relatives would gather around this stone sculpture for commemoration rituals. They would put the clothes of the dead person on the sculpture and smear sheep tail fat over his or her shoulders. They would also pour kumis or horse milk over the person from head to toe.
Enough. It's in the axle. What shall we do? 